I get the honor, privilege, all those cool terms, to introduce our uh, special not-so guest, as we like to say at Overflow, uh, Justine Morris. I've known her for a good, oh, you already got some woots. I, I've known her for, how many years have we known each other? I'd say eight, something like that, eight, nine years. And I've, I honestly, have, I can call it a privilege. I've had the privilege to serve under her as a leader as, um, for about three or four of those. And um, of all the years I've been in youth ministry, I've worked with amazing people, but I don't think I've ever had someone personally invest in me and make an impact in my life like Justine. And I don't think, it's funny, I can talk for hours and don't think I could like really grab how much like she means to me as a person and uh, how much our relationship is. And I even get to be her neighbor now, which is fun. So I love that. Anyways, I just encourage you, listen, uh, open those ears. She um, just doesn't throw out a sermon. Um, we've talked about it a lot. She agonizes over her sermon. She really goes after God's heart uh, for the sermon. And I know that what she's bringing is truly what God has for us today. So could you give it up for my good friend, Justine? Thanks, Adam. Good morning. How are you doing? Can I have the house lights up a little bit? I like to see faces. That is awesome. Oh, you're handsome today. Just today. <laughs> um, well, I have, um, I talked with Kurt last night, and he wanted me to say hello and thank you from Kurt and Julie. They've been at Foursquare Conference this week, International um, annual Foursquare Conference, where all of the pastors within the Foursquare um, denomination get together to worship, to pray, to be, uh, receive teaching, and to be encouraged. And these conferences are so important for pastors. Um, you know, Kurt and Julie never just get to go to church, you know? And so they got to spend a week just being and receiving and, and being encouraged. And, and this weekend they stayed. It's in Florida this year. Whatever. Seattle's just as cool, Lou, cold. <laughs> um, but they stayed there for the weekend, and they're having vacation, and that just makes me so happy to, to know that Kurt and Julie are having some time to relax and rest. So isn't that awesome? So they wanted to say thank you for um, letting them go. And, uh, um, yeah, so it was midnight when I talked with him. I went through uh, the message one more time with him last night, and... Um, I'm super excited about today, really excited. If you've got your Bibles, pull them out. We're going to be in Luke 2 um, and also in 1 Corinthians because we're in a series called Empowered. I don't know if you guys know this, but that is me. Did you know that? With Avi, baby Avi. That's Troy. Is that you, Josh? Yeah, yeah. They're real people from our congregation. Did you know that? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Anyway, we're doing a series in Luke and 1 Corinthians about empowered, the move of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And um, last time I shared with you in February, we were in Luke 1. We talked about being overshadowed and the fear of what the Holy Spirit could do to us, right? Um, and then Kurt asked me, well, read, you know, work out when you want to preach again. And so I read through Luke like we do devotionally, right? You sit down with your Bible and you read through and you say, Holy Spirit, like, make it stand out to me. What are you speaking to me today? So I read through Luke, thinking I would get into Luke, you know. Nope, Luke 2, bam. <laughs> so I called God and I was like, oh, man, the Bible's just full of God speaking. It's hard, right, to not find those speed bumps. So Luke 2, the story of Simeon has just knocked my socks off. So I am so excited to dig into the story of Simeon today. Um, and I don't know if you guys, uh, I mean, you've all been to probably many churches, so this may be obvious to most people, but the type of teaching we get from Kurt is quite unique. Um, he is a prophetic teacher. So what I mean by that is he goes into the word, he digs, and he's saying, God, what are you saying to us today from your word? So every Sunday we're getting a prophetic message from God to us for the day. Um, that's not standard, right? Um, actually, you can purchase sermons online. Did you know that? 
yeah, you can buy them, like well-researched, because not everybody is a gifted researcher, teacher, prophet, you know? And the body of Christ can band together. That's no problem. But with Kurt, we get original material, (laughs) fresh from the heart of God. Man, that is a gift. So based on that, we actually have a prophetic church body, right? We're hearing from God prophetically. Um, But what if there's more? I mean, that's great, right? A prophetic word from God for us. But what about you? Your needs, what you went through this week, is different than what I went through, right? Um, I mean, all of us, look around. We all have unique needs. I mean, Josh and I right now are, are looking into our future trying to work out what we should do about several things. Our eldest starts school this year. Where should we be living? What kind of schooling should she have? Um, I mean, These just might seem like trivial things to you, but to me, they're a big deal, and I want to know what God thinks. And I know he does think about me and my kids and my family. When I prayed about this message, um, and I said, God, what what do you want to say through Simeon's story? What I felt him say was, I am still speaking. And Simeon prophesied, what God was speaking. And I felt God say, prophecy is my choice. Plan A. I speak through other people. So um, that's where we're headed today. We're going to dig into the life of Simeon and just explore what would a church look like where everyone that came every time received a unique individual prophetic word for them where they were. Does that sound cool? Who would like a unique individual prophetic word today? (laughs) From the Lord, in truth, absolutely, right? That would rock, wouldn't it? I know. Okay, Greg, pray for us. If you don't know Greg, he is fantastic. Am I doing the Kurt thing right? (laughs) I love Kurt. You are fantastic, though, Greg. (laughs) God's so good. Father, uh, what comes to mind is to come aside to you today, to come aside, Lord, to to leave the busyness of, of where we're at, the things that we have gone through, and come aside, Father, to listen to to your voice, to the Father's voice. So, Lord, speak through Justine this morning. Holy Spirit, come, make our hearts fertile. Lord, make our spirits fertile in your presence, Lord, to to deeply implant the word so that we can respond in obedience to you. Bless Justine. Bless her heart and her mind, her spirit, Lord, as she delivers this message. Lord, may it be real to us. May it be planted there and grow and yield a great crop, God. And Lord, I want to pray for my friend, uh, Pastor Norm Willis, today at Christ Church Kirkland. Would you bless their congregation, Lord? Would you um, put your hand on each one that needs you there, as well as the entire body of Christ in this region? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, pull out your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke 2. We're starting at verse 25. <coughs> I, I just remember that <laughs> a couple of weeks ago I was sharing uh, during worship, and I said something about when God makes your heart flip. And somebody came up to me after church and said, what's a hot flip? And I forgot that I have an accent. So if, if I say anything today and you're like, what is she saying? It is totally fine to turn to your neighbor and be like, what is she saying? And <coughs> Holy cats. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, water. It's an old youth group joke. Love our youth group. Um, all right. We're going to look for speed bumps as we read through this, okay? So if you want to grab your Sunday notes and a pen, you can totally jot down if there's a word or a phrase or a moment that just stands out to your heart. This is good practice for your devotional reading. If you've never, like, had a devotional time where you've sat down with your Bible and you've felt like God spoke to you through it, we could practice right now. So this is what I do with my devotional reading. I sit down and I say, okay, God, show me something for me. 
today from your word. So Luke 2, 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. Hey, Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would see Christ the Messiah before he died. Led by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. As the parents of the child Jesus brought him in to carry out the rituals of the law, Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God. God, you can now release your servant. Release me from this world in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. It's now out in the open for everyone to see, a light to the Gentiles and of glory for your people Israel. Jesus' father and mother were speechless with surprise, marveling at these words. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child marks both the failure and recovery of many in Israel. A figure misunderstood and contradicted, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. But the rejection will force honesty as God reveals who they really are. Anna, the prophetess, was also there, a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. So here we are in the temple. I'm kind of feeling for Mary. What a year. An angel comes and tells her the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you're going to give birth to the Son of God. Joseph had an angel too, right? It worked out. God spoke. It was great. Then she got confirmation. She visited her cousin Elizabeth and John the Baptist, who was in Elizabeth's womb at the time, jumped and she confirmed. Elizabeth said, you're giving birth to the Messiah. Confirmation. Awesome, right? Then, nothing. (laughs) Nine months of angels? No. Burning bushes? No. 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 Man, I've been pregnant twice, and you worry that the baby's okay a lot. Anyone else, did you worry (laughs) that your baby was okay? Um, I wonder how Mary felt. (laughs) Then it's time to have Jesus, and there's nowhere to have the King of Kings. And I just wonder if she thought, okay, angel, any time (laughs) now. Like something, God, nothing at all. But then people turn up to worship. I'm losing my mic. Uh, People stand up, uh, come to worship him. Shepherds, the butt crack of society. Shepherds, no, hear me on this one. Fringe, 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 fringe folk, okay? They literally lived with animals on the ground, slept on the ground. Shepherds came, not angels. (laughs) And actually, I don't know if you know this, but not wise men. They did not come when Jesus was born. They set off on their journey when Jesus was born. A couple of years later is when they arrived. So all Mary has had, let's just chart it. Angel, awesome, right? Confirmation through Elizabeth, awesome. Yeah? Nothing. Giving birth in a barnyard. Shepherds. Okay, so then, you know, eight days, at eight days old, um, God's children brought their babies to the temple to be, well, their firstborn males to be circumcised and named at eight days. Nothing. <laughs> so here they are. Jesus is now six weeks old, 40 days, back at the temple for purification. Because that's what you do. If you're a Jewish family, that's what you do. It's the law. So she's 
following what she knows. When all else fails, just do what you know to do, right? But I just wonder, as she drew close to the temple, if she had a hope. Maybe I'll hear something today about how to raise this kid. Maybe. Do you remember anyone that's had babies six weeks old through the fog? Can you remember into that <laughs> craziness? Exhaustion. Exhaustion. And I just wonder if I'd been Mary. <laughs> if this is weird, I'm sorry. But it's just what I thought. Human milk, okay? For God's son? <laughs> like, I don't... I mean, here's the thing. Samson's mother, who Mary would have studied the story of Samson and his mother, Samson's mother got way more instruction than she did. Way more. And this is God's son, the Messiah. Is he a Nazarite? Shave his head? Like, what, what do I do? I, I, what do I do with this baby? So if I think anyone is, like, hungry to hear from God, it's got to be Mary, doesn't it? Desperate, I would say. And here they are. They've come to the temple, the temple where God's presence resides. Okay, so the temple um, is um, a concept that God gave. They needed to build a place where God's presence could reside, symbolically and literally. Okay, so within the temple, there were several courts. These guys are actually right now in the women's court. It was the only part of the temple that women could be. Okay, outer courts. These are not inner courts at all. The further in you go, the more important you need to be. Okay, so there are priests that are chosen to minister in the temple. They are inside. Inside the inside is the Holy of Holies, and that's where God's presence was. Blocked off with a giant curtain that we know gets torn. They did not know. But God was cut off from the people, and the priest was the one that went in between, between the people and God. This is the temple that they've come to. In the outer courts, before Pentecost, a man empowered by the Holy Spirit comes to the outer courts, and they have church. Don't they? Right there. I mean, this is not... Uh, a moment of sacrifice and offering inside the temple. But this is church. Cool, isn't it? Thank you, guys. Cute Simeon. <laughs> so I just think um, this incredible word that Simeon brought from God to Mary is not what you would expect. If he were to conjure up a word for a mother of a newborn, it might be something like, oh, it's going to be great, and you're going to be great. Right? <laughs> well, this is from God, and this is how we know it. Not great. Not great at all. <laughs> In fact, let's see if I can go back here. Oh, well, yes, we're on the right one. Uh, marks of failure and the recovery. A figure misunderstood and contradicted. Do you know what that meant? Your kid is going to be hated. And a sword will pierce through your soul also. This prophetic word was a rock for Mary for the next 30 plus years. Don't you think? We already know because the words already told us that she treasures things in her heart. Remember, she, Mary treasured these things in her heart. We, hear, we learned earlier in Luke. I know she tucked that one away. <laughs> she needed that, didn't she? This incredible word, I would expect it to come from a burning bush, honestly. I mean, Moses got one. Why wouldn't Mary deserve one? Or at least an angel, right? Or at least a priest, Somebody who was chosen to speak for God? But God used Simeon. And that makes me want to say, who the heck is Simeon? I want to know, who is this guy? Because whatever he has, I would like to also have that. <laughs> um, also, I would like to know some Simeons. That would be nice, wouldn't you? That'd be cool. Yeah, so um, let's head back in. And if you guys, did you, did you find any uh, speed bumps as we read through? 
What was the first thing that stood out to you? Oh, that's a good one. What else? Anything stand? What was the first thing that kind of stood out to you as we read? Looking for the consolation of Israel. Yeah. Can I tell you my first one? There was a man. Here's why. The book of Luke, Dr. Luke, wrote a book of details. He was known, he is known for his details. That is strange. Really strange. Look, Anna the prophetess was also there, a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. Lineage, position, identity. Okay? Who was Simeon? Tell me. Tell me who. A guy. A guy. Yeah, me too. I am no one. Simeon, just a guy. Man, that draws me in. Does that, like, pull at your heart? Simeon's story calls to us, extraordinary through ordinary. Just like Simeon, you and me. Is that exciting? No pedigree. It does make me think, though, who the heck did you think you were, Simeon? Walking into the temple, just a man, picking up God in your arms, knowing he knew it was God. You understand? I mean, he, you do not walk up to new mothers and grab babies out of their arms, first of all, right? Okay? He's not a priest. Outer courts, everybody is there. There would have been crowds there. And he just walks up and grabbed that baby and started prophesying with power. That is audacious, isn't it? Who the heck did you think you were, Simeon? Man. Um, all right, the, sem- the second speed bump that did it for me was the same one that you said, Greg. Righteous and devout. There was a man, this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. We don't know what his lineage is, and we don't know what his position is. We don't know the standard things that we usually know about Jewish people. But we do get to know something about who he is as a man. Okay? So these words, righteous and devout, um, appear throughout the Bible. Um, And actually, they're used very rarely. Um, Noah was a righteous man. Obadiah was a devout worshiper. I don't know of any other, there probably is, but I couldn't find it, devout and righteous in one mention. So he's just been ranked with Noah. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. Noah was the only one that got to stay alive. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) this is pretty awesome. Um, What righteous and devout speak of um, or is his relationship with God. Righteous means right standing before the Lord. And remember, this is before Christ. We are all made righteous, right? We all have this freedom of understanding what right standing is. He is from an era where they did not. And yet he knew God. He walked with him without pedigree, <laughs> without position, as God's child. He would have been... Um, Uh, a student of the word, of the scriptures. He would have known how God's voice sounded because of his studies. And the devout thing (laughs) is like daily walking it out. Every day, righteous before the Lord, every day being careful and and, and precise about living out the laws to honor God. So this, this guy is hardcore for God. And I dig that about Simeon. And this word looking, I really wanted to uh, dig into the Greek on this word looking. So if you're a Greek nerd like me, um, love this word looking. Um, I think it's uh, prodoskamai. It's this great word. So if you're into that, note that one down. It's worth digging into. But basically, um, have you ever been people watching? Confession. Who's a people watcher? 
<laughs> I love it. Okay. People watching, right? And you're just looking. Not this. That's not that kind of looking. You right now looking at me, not, not, not this. This is like this. Looking. Leaning. Like on toes. You know what I mean? Like just looking for the consolation of Israel, waiting for the Messiah, ready for God to move, watching, ready. Um, I was uh, going through this, um, this with Adam this week. He's part of my uh, preach preparation team. I have a bunch of people that I consult with as I sermon prep, and he's one of mine. And so I was running through with him, and he's like, do you know what that's like? It's like an umpire. It's like an umpire, right? When you're an umpire for a baseball game, and I'm just saying this because Adam told me, not because I personally know, but <laughs> I'm sure American sports are awesome. Anyway, um, <laughs> I've been to a game. There are cheerleaders, right? No, not that one. Um, hot dogs. I know there were hot dogs there. Anyway. So an umpire is somebody who is trained, right, educated, very skilled. He gears up, walks on the field, and gets down so he can see the strike zone. Is that what it's called? Yeah, me. Okay. <laughs> He's not standing. I mean, look at him. He's in, watching, ready. He knows something's about to happen, and I want to catch it. Because I need to interpret what's happening here for the people that are watching. Because they're in the stands. They can't see. I don't know <laughs> if we have any baseball enthusiasts here who love to yell things from the stands. You can't see. You are not down there. It's not okay. <laughs> Those poor umpires. But they're down in there. You know? They're a part of the game. And I actually love this illustration for prophecy. God is moving. Stuff is happening. There are people in the stands. Love God. Love to watch, right? But a prophet can call the action precisely when the view of another person might miss it. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Baseball and Jesus, who would have known? <laughs> Righteous, devout, and looking. Oh, Simeon, don't you like him? My, uh, my almost five-year-old, uh, uh, her great-grandmother passed away last year, and so we talk about Gigi lives with Jesus in heaven, and, and, and as we read through the Bible, she's incredible, by the way, this little girl. I'm a huge fan. Um, but she was saying, oh, I, Mom, I'm just so excited to get to heaven because I want to meet Peter. He seems great. <laughs> Isn't she fantastic? Well, Simeon's my new favorite. I'm so excited. I mean, yes, we're going to be there for Jesus and, and God and the Holy Spirit. Yes, right? But aren't you also super excited to meet other humans that dared to walk in faith? Yeah. Simeon, he's awesome. Okay. Simeon's story calls to us, get leaning and looking. Does that excite you? Because you don't have to be anything special. Get leaning and looking. All right, speed bump number three. What did you guys find next as you read through? So we did righteous and devout and looking, so I hit the ones that were yelled out. Yes, totally the one that smacked me too. Led by the Spirit. Um, because, does that phrase uh, remind you of anyone else? Anyone else led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted? Jesus. Simeon was led by the Spirit like Jesus was led by the Spirit. That is worth a holy cats right there. What? 
just a man led like Jesus was led? Pre-Pentecost too, right? This is pre the Holy Spirit being poured out on earth for all of us. Simeon was a trendsetter ahead of his time. Man. The Holy Spirit was upon him, led by the Spirit to preach the gospel to the lost. Is that what it says? Led by the Spirit to go out into the world. Where was Simeon led by the Spirit to go? Into the temple? No, no, you go to the temple or you come to church to get filled so you can go out. Right? What's happening here? Is this surprising to anyone else? Is it just me? (laughs) Led by the Spirit to go into the temple. What brought you to church today? You know, I go to church because it's what I do. And actually, I'm passionate about it, so it's not like a... um, you know, a requirement thing. But Mary and Joseph were at the temple because it's what they did. It's what you do. There's nothing wrong with that, right? To be committed and faithful, that is awesome. Sundays roll around, I'm here. (laughs) But there's something, uh, I don't know, convicting, evoking, inspiring, I don't know what, what's the word? about this, that, that we would be led into the temple. So, quick uh, um, side conversation. Temple and synagogue. Uh, these are two different things. The temple was established by God, we talked about it before, where God's presence could reside. Synagogue is a man-made idea. Um, Historians believe that synagogue, the concept of synagogue, was birthed during um, times of exile. So there was one temple in Jerusalem. When the Israelites were not living near the temple, they couldn't go to the temple, right? And it's kind of like how they are now. The temple is not in function. They cannot go to the temple. But, um, But when you're away from God's land and you can't go access his temple... Um, two things can happen. In the Assyrian exile, um, the Assyrians would not let the Israelites live, sorry, I'm saying Israelites, but the tribes, they would not let the tribes live near each other. They spread them out. And they're actually known as the lost tribes. Okay? They're gone. They had to marry whoever was nearby. Um, They were not together. The Babylonian exile, they let them live together. Kind of like um, it happens like um, in San Francisco, there's Chinatown, right? Or in Seattle, we have the International District. You see when immigrants, holla immigrants, um, when immigrants come to a land that is foreign and they want to stay with their own. Uh, I understand that that is controversial, controversial here in the States and, and the problems arise from that. Um, here's the thing. If you believe that the culture you were born and raised in is good and right, then you do want to group together. We are just like the Israelites in exile. Even though this country has a history of godliness, when we look out our windows today, this is not God's land and these are not God's people. Okay? But we are. But we're living in exile. Heaven is our home. So until we get there, we are living in exile. It doesn't matter which land on earth you're in, right? And so we have synagogue. Synagogue was 10 or more people getting together with a united heart. They wanted to remember the ways of God, study the scriptures, pray and worship, okay? So anytime there was a gathering, here's the cool thing about synagogue. Any right um, standing member of the synagogue could be chosen to read scriptures. Isn't that cool? Jesus spoke at synagogues. So man-made invention, but totally endorsed by Jesus as he walked on earth, totally blessed the concept of synagogue. And it's a model for church. That's where we get our church. So today we're meeting. We're actually a synagogue. I don't know if you know that, but 
that's where modern church comes from. There are not a lot of specifics in the word about how churches are supposed to function. Sunday, weekdays, a church building, homes. They're, they're, it's kind of like up for personal application and cultural application because God is good like that, <laughs> right? He lets us express our worship for him uniquely. Here are some things that we are told about the church or synagogue. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. So here's what we know about our gathering together. It doesn't matter what kind of building. It doesn't matter what day of the week you meet. What matters is you gather together and that spiritual gifts would happen there. That's good. At least we know that. Let love be your highest goal, but also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the gift of prophecy. So here we have another indicator of what our church gathering should be like. We should be desiring prophecy. Now what this does for me and the story of Simeon, it makes me wonder where prophecy is in the church. Now, we have prophecy here at this church. We have people that know how to hear God's voice and speak it. I wouldn't say that worldwide the church is in love with prophecy, (laughs) right? Prophecy is God's plan for speaking to us. It's actually part of his plan A. It's not plan B. It's not well, if you can't hear from God yourself, he'll help you out by having someone prophesy for you until you're good enough to do it for yourself. That's not prophecy. It's not a safety net. It's not a second level thing. It's first level. It's his plan for us. We shouldn't be asking whether we should be having prophecy. We should be asking why. Why would God want prophecy? Because isn't God capable of coming and talking to us directly? I mean, he's God, right? And Jesus has redeemed us. We are made righteous. We can be in God's presence. There's no problems here. And yet, he chooses to use prophecy. That just uh, stirs my heart with curiosity, (laughs) honestly. And here we have this moment where the very Son of God, God himself, made flesh, come to earth, and it's prophecy that is used to speak for him. Cool. Is that cool? Tell me that it's cool. All right. I do want to say that there is a real problem with prophecy Actually, many layers of problems with prophecy. First of all, we don't know how to hear God, (laughs) do we? I mean, even on the days where I'm like, I've heard from God, I'm just not sure that I heard from God. Even on my best day. Anyone else feel that way? Or like, I'm sure I heard from God, but I'm open to to being wrong because (laughs) I'm just a human. Do you feel that way? (laughs) So there's a problem. We are fallible and fleshly. Here's another problem. People are crazy. Some people, right? Has anyone had like one of those prophecy moments where somebody comes and gives you a prophecy and you're like, how long will this go for? And why isn't somebody rescuing me? Have you felt that way? So yeah. Is prophecy a concern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is not a baby we should let go out with the bathwater. Do you know why? Because it's God's heart for there to be prophecy. So if we just say, it's too weird, it's too risky, it's not safe, we can't control people, let's just stick with everything other than prophecy, we have just thrown out part of God's plan A. Not cool, (laughs) not good, not healthy. There's no life. If we let go of this thing and push it out, there's no life there. Simeon models something beautiful for us. Prophecy comes through ordinary people 
who are passionate about God, who know his word, know his voice, and do audacious things. I would like more people like that to prophesy because then the percent of crazy prophecies goes down. Right now, we're letting it be like 95%. That, not us. Clearly, we are wise and mature here and we don't have the crazy ones, right? I am a crazy one. I don't know if you've worked that out yet. But you know what I'm saying? If, if, if we walk away from something we're afraid of, then we let that become the majority. And then people think that prophets are weirdos and that God speaks through wackos. And he does. But he also speaks through, there was a man named Simeon. So, you, you, God wants to speak through you. I have some friends that are going to come uh, talk with me right now because I thought we can leave this as a discussion of a scripture and, and, and it's almost clinical even though it's inspirational. But I'd love to share um, some of my friends' stories with you about how prophecy has impacted their lives. Would that be cool? Okay. Um, I need that mic. Thank you. Roger, come on up here, my friend. Roger Miller is a fantastic guy. I do want to say... (laughs) Hi, friend. All right, so... um, I'm going, to interview, I'm going to give a little intro here. You can take the mic. Give a little intro. So um, Roger and Kathy are part of CMA, Christian Motorcycle Association, because you can bike and love Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Um, just like baseball, you can have Jesus at baseball. So, um, but, but you've been doing something a little audacious. Correct. And so I'd like you to talk about that. Okay. Okay. What I like to do is every time before we go out on a ride, Um, whether it's two, three, four, or five of us, we always ask for a divine appointment that'll happen during that ride. But I kind of take it down even one step further. What we do, what I do, and I always have these available in my saddlebag, it says, blessed in 2013. Now, every year we do bike blessings. Now, it's amazing, it's amazing Even the hardcore guys, the Hells Angels, the Banditos, all of them, they don't like church, but boy, they want that bike to be blessed. So it gives me the opportunity. We go up, we have them sit on the bike, we put our hands on their shoulder, and we bless that bike. But we always get God in there. But to say that, I don't go up to everyone. I listen to what God says. There are some people that wouldn't accept it, but there are others that would. So I always listen to the Spirit, and I never, I don't think, I, in all the blessings I've done, and three weeks ago, did about 50 of them at a triker rally, non-Christian group. But each one was a little bit different. I would listen to God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say over this person or over this couple? Thank you, Roger. I do want to ask, um, who the heck do you think you are? Are you ordained? (laughs) What? (laughs) Do you think so? Does anybody here think so? Most of these people know me well enough to say, nah. But I do know that you love God. Amen. You study his word and you know him and you know his voice. And I just think that you're audacious like Simeon and I think that's cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um... What I love about Roger's story is that he said, I don't go up to everyone. And I think that here's something cool about empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When we have it um, practiced and rehearsed within the context of body where it's safe in here, right? We can practice. Then when we're getting out and outreaching, that it's less hit and miss because we know how to be led by God. He is praying for some people who are packing heat. He is praying for the worst of the worst. Like things you've only seen in, seen in movies. You know, like biker gang guys. The banditos, they're 
scary business, right? But when God moves him, it's like Simeon walking into the temple, grabbing a baby. It's like when you know, have you felt this when God's told you to do something? You can't not do it. It like becomes this like compulsion and you're like, I got to do, I got to do this. And I'm seeing that outworked in Roger's life. It's so cool. All right, Becca. It's my sweet Becca. I've known Becca since she was in junior high. She was one of our youth girls. And she's going to share about a weekend. We used to do these prayer and prophecy retreats with junior hires. Crazy, right? But we used to take junior hires and senior hires up to Bellingham to a retreat. And we would send them out into the woods and go say, pray and hear from God a prophetic word for someone else here this weekend. And then come back and we're all going to prophesy over each other. And uh, Josh and I never thought that it wouldn't happen. I don't know why. We didn't think that. We probably should have. But Becca, tell us your story. Yeah, like you were saying, Justine gave us an environment where it was, it wasn't let's go and see if we can hear God. It was we're going to go and you're all going to hear God and it's what are you going to hear? And I love that about the weekend because it wasn't just sit and listen. It was, okay, we're going to go on a prayer walk or we're going to, read his word because he speaks through his word and that's so you can hear his voice. And then we're going to um, listen if he does give you a word um, or a picture when you're praying. So there's all those different ways to hear him. And um, it was really exciting and I, I couldn't not go. And I was probably, I think I was in high school, I can't quite remember when, but um, I was a standing stone in my faith because that's where I learned to hear God probably, I would say. Um, and the thing that was really, really special to me is that feeling where that compulsion that you just have to say it is that there was probably, I don't know, maybe 10 of us, and we're all sitting, and we're taking turns. Okay, we're going to pray for this person now, and then we're all going to share what God spoke about this person, and you're all going to share. And feeling that rush of, oh, my gosh, God gave me something for somebody and I don't know if this is right, but I have to share it because God's put it on my heart. And I just, it was, it was almost addicting to be able to hear God in that way and just being like, wow, God, you're speaking, you're moving. Um, and when it came to be my turn, I was like, okay, I know God's good, and I'm so excited to receive whatever he wants to say to me. And um, at that point, I was just quiet and listening and you know, just that nervousness of what's he going to say and who's, who's he going to say it through. And Josh. Josh was kind of just moving around the back of the room, um, letting all of us have the opportunity to speak what God was saying. And Josh comes up. He stops. He comes up to the back of this couch. I remember exactly where I was sitting. And he said, God gave me something for you and wanted me to tell you God is your father and he's proud of you. And I burst into tears because at that point, what that meant to me, like, I knew God was my father, and I knew he loved me, but God was speaking, and I knew that that was, whatever I was going to hear was be directly from him, and um, I can say that what that did to me, where I was at with my relationship with my dad, I love my dad, and I know my dad loves me, and I was at a point where I was a little bit frustrated with my dad and my relationship with him, and that spoke so much that God was my father, and he was proud of me, and my my dad here is proud of me as well, but what that did to me was it put a desire in my heart to be seeking that, not just for that weekend, but I wanted that to be a part of my life. And so at that point um, on Sundays, we did this thing called Word and Worship where we'd go and we'd hear a word from God during worship and we'd speak that out. And it might have been a prophetic word for the body. I mean, some of you have been experiencing that and... Um, after that weekend, I wanted to be around people who heard God's voice, and I wanted to learn that. And, um, and so that's how it's transformed my life. I, I wouldn't want it without it. So, Thank you, Becca. I want to say uh, at that retreat, uh, one of the kids said, I just had this prophetic word for a specific kid and, and said, it's a snowman without a face. And I looked at Josh, and I was like, oh, dang. <laughs> They're making stuff up now. Um, but another girl in the group burst into tears and said, nobody knows this about me, but I never put faces on my snowman. God knows me. He sees me. He loves me. I mean, just <sighs> amazing. And I think if a junior higher can hear God, then we can too, right? 
Yeah. Um, I have one more uh, to share. Um, it's Jamie's story, our missionary in Thailand. She um, led a team to Thailand, a youth group team, and when she left there, she felt like maybe she would go back. So she was considering going for a year, but what very few people knew is she had said to me, I, I'm in her threefold, uh, she said, I'm, I'm not going back alone. <laughs> I can't do that alone. It's very remote, very remote. And, um, you know, as a young single female heading into the world, do you want to spend years upon years alone? I mean, that was a deep fear. Also, she didn't want to abandon her family here in the States. It's difficult to change countries and leave people behind. I mean, even just to change cities, isn't it? <laughs> to leave people behind. So she had some deep fears. Deep. At a missions presentation night, Babette brought a word for her and said, I feel like God is saying some things to you. And Jamie's testimony is that Babette said, God is going to give you community. And Jamie knew it wasn't just, and I will be with you, <laughs> right? But she really believed God was promising humans. And she's been there, she's going into her second year now. She has actually literally had other teachers go out there to be with her. And people visit. I mean, she's getting to see this prophecy unfold. She said, I don't know if I would have gone. I probably would have, but I don't know if I would have gone if God hadn't given me that hope. And she's out there ministering for the Lord with a promise that anchors her. The other cool thing is Babette feels totally intertwined with Jamie. She's now watching for Jamie's life to unfold. And here's what I see. Prophecy's good for the person that receives it, right? When you receive a word through someone else from God, you're like, that is good. Everyone, like, I needed that confirmation. I was hearing that, and now I know it's not just me, and I didn't just make it up. Or like an umpire sees something you couldn't quite see. Wow, I didn't consider it from that angle. It's just edifying for the person that receives it. It's fantastic for the person that gives it. So good. When you know that you've spoken something that's from God, and the person's like, that's from God. You're like, really? I heard from God? Yes. And then your lives are intertwined. So what prophecy does for us is it binds us together as the body of Christ. You know, we become interconnected because of it. This is good. Good for the receiver, good for the giver, and good for the body. God wants prophecy. Plan A. Adam, come on up. This is our closing uh, point. I wanted Adam to share a testimony of what today's sermon did for him because he already heard it earlier in the week. And I actually didn't get to finish my whole practice through with him because he was like, oh my gosh, God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me. He cut me right off. It was so rude. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was thinking about it as I was sitting there. I was like, actually, I'm kind of a victim of the sermon. Uh, we were standing... We talk a lot between our houses on this berm. And so she was in the driveway, and I was standing up, and, and I got this cool thing, and I was like, no, the umpire leaning in. And then God was like, smack in the face. And I was like, oh, wait, oh. I, I go to the summer camp every summer. I, I staff uh, two weeks. Uh, we do the four square. We send a, you know, 250 junior hires one week, and the next week is high schoolers. And, and I get the privilege to staff that, and I love it. And what's cool is there's just something different about going to camp, you know? Uh, you go out there and you just know God's going to show up. And so the whole week, I'm doing this. And that's what God was showing me. He's like, Adam, when you go to camp, you're in. Because I have to be on staff. I have to be listening because I have 250 students. And God could speak to me about one of those at any minute. And so, of course, I'm leaning in. You know, and then throughout the year, I, I get invited by youth pastor friends of mine to go speak at other youth groups, right? And, and listen, I love speaking at mine. I speak at our youth group often. And and, you know, I preach some darn good messages, I think, you know. And, but I can also get it wrong. And it's okay because there you know, are our students and I love them. But when I go to another church, I don't get that luxury because that youth pastor is trusting me to come speak to his kids. So the whole week before, the two weeks before, I'm leaning in. And I'm like, God, what are you saying here, right? And then what God showed me is like, so that's great, Adam. But what about when you're at church? And I went, oh, my gosh. And I told Justine this. I sit in the stands. Because Justine said earlier, there's Babette's here and Chris Maddox here and 
and uh, Kimberly and Marianne, those, they got it. They're leaning in. And then God was like, but I give you 25 students every week. You're, I made you one of the youth directors at this church. Why aren't you leaning in? And I was like, oh, guilt. <laughs> you know? But I know it wasn't guilt. It was a challenge. Church, I want to lean in. I want to lean in for my students. I want to lean in for you guys. But like Justine said, lean in for me. I want to come on Sunday, and I want to get a word from somebody here. I need them just as much as anybody else. So I told Justine, like, this message convicts me to get in there. I don't want to sit in the stands when I come to church on a Sunday. I, I want to be in there with you guys. I want to be Simeon. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Simeon's story calls to us. Extraordinary through ordinary, get leaning and looking. God is speaking and prophecy is part of his plan. We all come in a little like Mary and Joseph, don't we? Needing something from God. And at the same time, we can all come in like Simeon. We can do both. In fact, we have to do both. We need it. The body needs it. Do you feel that vacuum for it? Do you know what I'm saying? Like there's a need in us for this. So I'm wondering if you want to be like Simeon. What would it be like if on Sundays, people walked into this building and God spoke specifically, uniquely into their lives. Every time. Every time. Adam actually said, I'm kind of worried about that. I'm worried that it won't be special. When I go to camp, it's unique. It's special. It's a treasure to me. If it's happening every week, will it just become kind of ho-hum? Well, something hit me. I think it was God. I don't know. But I got, like, kind of bold as we were talking. And I was like, I don't know, Adam. Is splashing in the water of God in your ankles a couple times a year special? Or is being in over your head in his unending well of life? You know what I mean? What are we afraid of? That that won't be as special as this? <laughs> you know what I mean? There is a depth that God has for us. When you're prophesying in the power of God, you are knowing him and you cannot know him that way any other way. Yeah? Man, I want to be like Simeon. Do you want to be like Simeon? I'm wondering if you would be willing for all of us to stand together as a body and ask God, maybe we need to stand like this. <laughs> And say, God, I want to be like Simeon. I want to speak with prophecy. Would you be willing? Yesterday, um, I sat at Starbucks and sermon, final sermon prepped for like four hours. And as part of that, I decided I would pray for my friends who were on a retreat. Our worship steering team went on a steering team retreat. And I decided I should probably pray for them. <laughs> So I did, by name, each person I took some time. Not much, actually, to be honest. Probably maybe five minutes per person. And I asked God, I need a prophetic word for every one of them. So I sat down, six names, and I wrote out prophetic words for each one, and then I texted them audaciously, <laughs> right? I was like, because I don't even know. There was one in particular where I was like, I don't even really want to send this, because I'm fairly sure it's wrong. It wasn't like a happy prophecy. It was kind of like a sad one. <laughs> So I sent it to this friend. I was like, I'm sad. I'm praying for you, and I just have this deep sadness, and here's what I feel like God is saying. My phone rang. That is absolutely right. That's exactly what's happening with me right now. And I got to spend the rest of the day praying for resolution of those feelings, and I feel totally intertwined. They were at a retreat all day. I was there too. <laughs> they didn't even know, you know, in the spirit. So I just kind of put it into practice yesterday, fleetingly, at Starbucks, and it yielded fruit. So, I wonder, next Sunday, we're gathering together. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about Anna. 
And I'm so excited to get to share with you again. And I'm just wondering this week if you would take some time to sit down, pray for a person, and jot down what God says, and bring it next week and give it to them. Or text. Or email. Don't even put your name on it. If you want to do it like, I'm not sure about it, start with someone you know. That's actually safer. Because you want to be able to say, did I get it right? Am I hearing God? And if they say no, guess what? Try again. That day in the temple was not Simeon's first day prophesying. I would put money on that. (laughs) Wouldn't you? Yeah. But let's get practicing. Let's get in the zone. Yeah? Yeah? All right. Would you stand with me? Would that be okay? And as a body, you can get in the, in the leaning pose if you want to, if, you're like, if you like to do that kind of thing. Would it be creepy if we all held hands? A little bit? Let's do it. Let's do it. Come here, babe. Across the aisles. We can span the aisles. Come on. I see a hand, a free hand. Amy, you have no hands. Come and join us. Come on. (laughs) All right. Oh, Father God. God, thank you that you're still speaking. Thank you that you care about today and that you have things to tell us about our todays. God, thank you that you would use us to speak for you. God, we want to be like Simeon, that this church would be a place of overflowing prophecy, truthful, healthy, alive words from you, Lord. We put aside complacency. We put aside fear. We even put aside busyness. God, We choose to get in that lean and look. Speak to us, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now um, a hymn that you probably will know. And just let it be you and God working this through.